Hello, this is Rene from Slide GmbH. I'm really happy to be here at the open source conference at Siemens. Today we will talk a little bit about our experience with e-commerce solutions, uh, with standard solutions, and maybe a little approach how we solve some of the issues we tackled in the last 20 years. Hello, everyone. Also, warm thank you from my side for the invite. Really happy to be here. Good, we prepared uh, a little agenda. I hope there is enough time when I asked Roger on what we should talk about, if we should focus a little bit more about technical things, business, or about uh, the software development process or about software as an open source. He said, yeah, that's good to talk about all of it. <laughs> so we might talk a little bit too quick, <laughs> but we need to, or I think it will be okay. We have half an hour, so it should be okay. First, uh, a little bit about uh, our company. Slide GmbH is a rather young company. It was founded in 2017. We're from Zurich in Switzerland. But we have a, a rather big experience in B2B e-commerce. Um, I myself have started in 1998 uh, in a small agency, Imisage, and we were already there focused on B2B e-commerce. I've developed already more than 30 B2B <coughs> online shops or e-commerce applications. Depends on the scale or how you call it. And more important is we used various different solutions in the last 20 years to build those online shops. In the beginning, we used Perl-based Intershop. Later, we switched to ePages. We used the Java version of Intershop. We used uh, different cloud-based solutions. And for sure, we used different versions or different implementations of SAP uh, online shops. In the beginning, it was more like SAP Internet Sales Application. Then they renamed it to e-commerce. Then we started working with SAP Hybris. By then, it was not yet uh, part of Hybris, but then later part. And we also implemented two own solutions. It was around, I think it was around 2006, where we built uh, the first two kind of custom implementations of online shops for our customers. Hello, everyone. Also from my side, my name is Lucas Olimine. I'm a full stack software developer, now doing web applications for 14 years. Majority of it in uh, uh, e-commerce, B2B, complex integrations. Um, I also did uh, software as a service solution uh, for audit. And with most of my customers, I worked for multiple years and I was involved through the whole process from requirements engineering, consulting, through the development of the initial solution, um, in, uh, improving with features and uh, of course maintenance and then sometimes also assisted with uh, migrating them to next solutions. Then Rene already uh, mentioned Sly. Sorry, so wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we're specialized on uh, B2B e-commerce, uh, complex integrations usually. This can be in various systems like ERP, CRM, whatever is around that needs to be integrated. Um, as well as software architecture, microservices, uh, technical technical consulting. Our whole team is uh, Swiss based in Zurich. We are around ten people right now, um, employed and a few freelancers. Around three, we work uh, usually on projects with for technologies we are not implementing by ourselves or just to to scale up uh, to be able to to react faster on customer needs. Um, our solution is open source, and we are also a member of Tech Hub and also founder. That's a network of Swiss IT professionals, uh, mostly small companies to, to help each other with business and of course also with resources. And we are also Swiss made software certified. As mentioned, I think in the title of the presentation and also in the introduction, we want to share our experience with standard solutions a little bit with you. 
and it's about e-commerce standard solutions. I think standard solutions are great if you want to use them as it is, as it's planned. And our customers, they tend to go a little bit too far over the years, right? Maybe in the beginning, you're quite satisfied with what you get, but then after a while or sometimes already in in the project, they, they, they need more, they want to go different ways, right? I mean, we now assume that this is our standard e-commerce solution, little house, and this house has a certain flexibility, right? You can maybe make it a bit bigger, maybe you can make it a different color, you can make it two stories, you can maybe duplicate it and make several houses of it, Reihen ein Familienhäuser in the Schweiz or something similar. But there are certain limitations because normally our customers, they're not looking for a house. They rather want to have a tower or a castle or whatever. And that's something which we experience very often in our projects. And I think it was in the first time in around 2005, when we were also working on, on one of our projects where the vendor, by then it was an Intershop based enterprise solution, kind of said, you're out of support now with the amount of customizing you did on the solution, we're not able to support you anymore. But they didn't kind of, we still had to pay the license fee, right? But they said for the license fee, you kind of get nothing because we were not able to, to upgrade anymore to the newest versions. And whenever we struggled, mainly performance with the Oracle database, they said it's kind of, you have to solve it by yourself. So there is certain limitations and that's also a discussion we very often have when, when we talk about SAP ERP implementations. There's two ways to do it. The right way is you adapt to the standard and the wrong way is you try to, to adapt the standard to you, right? That's happened very, very often in the last few years where just such projects, they, they got into never ending mode, right? There is different point of views when you look at the e-commerce application. I think most of the customers, most of the people, when they look at the, an online shop, they see like this, they see a front end with search bar assortments, uh, login, cart, and stuff like that. So that's the same, right? We have the customer, we have the shop. But when we look on an online shop, we see it a bit different because we see the sheer amount of integrations and challenges which come around. And there are a bit more of them in, in B2B e-commerce, right? In, in B2C, some of the things can be easier, don't have to. But in B2B, we have a lot of challenges with integrations, right? We have complex pricing, so we need real-time price calculation in ERP backend systems. We have large customers. They don't want to put their large orders just in the shopping cart, one article after each other. They want to have e-procurement integrations like Ariba, OCI, EDI. We have CMS systems to have more flexibility to display content or personalized content. We have a lot of different touch points like in-store, web browser, mobile apps, scanner solutions. We have marketing automations, for sure very important CRM systems. You need to know your customers. You don't just want to sell them. You want to learn about your customers and maybe also provide them after a while personalized content. And also really important is our customers, they don't maintain their products in the web shop, right? Some of them have 30,000 products. Some of them have 300,000 products. Some of them maybe even more than a million. So they maintain their product data in PIM systems specialized systems just for data quality and maintaining large amounts of, of data and maintain the quality of this data, also maintain media assets, videos, 3D drawings, and all this stuff. Also important for sure is uh, authentication and authorization. So normally we have to integrate something like uh, 
ADFS Federation with Active Directory or, or other online systems, EAM systems, maybe you've seen the talk yesterday from, from Chaos about Citadel. It's a, also a rather new system from, from St. Gallen here in Switzerland. And also a rather big pain point is also uh, SEO, SEA integrations, right? To make Google and the guys happy because they have a lot of demands that you get a good ranking, you need to be fast, you need to have good visibility, good usability, you have to have certain texts that they understand your content better. So that makes at the end the online shop not just what the customer sees. So there is a lot of complexity behind it. I guess that will be similar with applications you may be managing in your daily business, right? So if we look at the standard solution, which is capable to do at least half of this, then most probably it will look something like this. That's a, a ERM, a database model of one of the standard solutions. And when we now go to a customer project, this is not enough, right? Our customers have special needs. They need other fields. They need other attributes. So we start digging into this data model, which is already way too complex, and start extending it. I'm not sure how many of you have experience with larger database models. Sooner or later, you struggle with performance, right? Because as more data you have, as more complexity, then sooner or later, the scalability is a problem. Web applications are quite easy to scale. Databases, transactional databases are really, really difficult to scale. And those standard solutions, all of I know, they're always using SQL relational databases out of the box. Maybe they also use something like a search engine, Elastic, Solar or something, but to maintain their data, it's always relational databases. And if we now kind of extend those already complex systems and make them into what the customer needs, then it very often gets very, very tricky. And we end up with a very complex monolithic systems, which tend to, to take minutes to build and deploy, sometimes hours to run all the integration and unit tests. And normally it also takes at least half an hour to do a deployment. So we are far away from like modern applications, microservice-based applications where they sometimes try to achieve 100 deployments plus a day. I mean, that's maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be 100, but it should be kind of more than once a month, right? Or at least more than once a week. Another problem with those rather complex applications is after a while, they're outdated, right? In B2B, normally web shops are re-platformed all seven to 10 years. In B2C, it's already after normally around five years. So, I mean, if you have heard the talk before it was about the, what was it, the year 38 problem, right? I mean, we're pretty certain that all the web shops we build right now, they will not survive that long. They will be replaced within the next seven to 10 years, even if they're good. Maybe we, they will be done by the same team, but with just kind of the next technology, right? Those projects from, from a size, I mean, normally we talk about like, so let's say 100 to 1 million Swiss francs of license fee, maybe implementation costs one to 2 million. That's only kind of external development, right? That's not including your own employees and your internal consultants and no infrastructure and nothing right project duration between one and three years and the, the biggest problem is during this time you block your innovation stream right you will be focused on just implementing a new version of what you already have maybe you can introduce some of the innovations you're looking for but normally in the initial project you don't have time to implement everything you need. It's even worse. A lot of improvements you've done in the last 10 years will be lost because in the new standard solution, they're not part of it. So you will also lose some of the innovations. And um, that means kind of every new version of webshop 
is also one step back. And that's where we think maybe there is better solutions. The main issues we said with the standard solution is if you use them as they are, they're great. If you try to modify them to your needs, it often comes to very high complexity. They normally offer flexibility, but limited. And another issue is they're really slow in adapting to new trends. If there is a new trend on the market, normally those standard providers, they need at least three years to implement the new trend in the standard solution. And then until the customers will adapt them and deploy them with the newest version of the shop, it will take another one to two years because they first need to upgrade to the most recent version. They will to upgrade some of their customizing and then they have, can implement and benefit from the new features. And for sure, there's sometimes limitations coming from the licenses. Some of the vendors have kind of, they force you to, to host in their own clouds, which for some customers might be not the choice, right? I mean, I think most of the customers are willing to house, host in the cloud, but normally in the cloud of their choice and not in the cloud of the vendor's choice, right? And with this, with this experience, with this experience we experienced over and over again in the last 20 years. We kind of discussed already quite a while that it's maybe time to, to do something new. And last year when we were, when we had a little time during the first loca lockdown of Corona, we kind of make, made this dream con come true. And we, we started again now the kind of third version of of the next generation let's call it e-commerce solution i think luca might tell you a little exactly. bit more about what we actually built it's maybe it's not exactly the same as the other people built right exactly so based on the experience we had as Rennie said with the standard solutions and the drawbacks we decided to build our own uh, solution Rene, can you go to the next slide please Sorry, yeah. I was trying to get some, some water. Yeah. I have a bit of dry throat, but yeah. I'm back in a second. <laughs> so what is what is Velox? Velox is not a product nor a platform. It's a foundation. So the idea is that you can build your e-commerce solution for many different scenarios. It's based on best practices for, for microservice architecture. It's completely open source under the MIT license. There's no license fees also for commercial use. And we build a, a quick start with a so-called accelerator uh, demo project. So Rene explained the life cycle of a standard e-commerce product before. So every seven to 10 years, replatforming uh, a lot of going back, implementing the features you already did again. And so we came up with another solution that allows you to replace certain modules and services whenever you actually have a need for new features, for a new integration. If you replace your ERP system, you also just replace the service talking to it. And so you, there's no need for big bang migrations. And this whole approach is applicable for front-end, back-end, integrations, and infrastructure. So our dream, at least, is that there is no more replatforming, right? I mean, if a technology is obsolete, if something infrastructure-wise is obsolete, if we need something new, we will replace certain services. We will exactly. never, ever replace the whole application at once anymore, right? So why should, should someone choose Velox, or why did we choose Velox? So the difference between uh, a project with Velox to a standard solution is you're actually spending your budget on implementing features and not on licenses. You have the maximal flexibility. You're not bound to a monolithic system. You have a very fast time to market and don't have to wait until you get the out-of-the-box features from your vendors. 
you have a real microservice architecture with uh, real modularity. So you don't need to wait for the next major release to do your update. You just update certain services whenever you, you see a benefit in doing it. And how else can you benefit? You have much less code than in a standard solution because you only take the code that you actually need. So you also don't need to maintain this code that's irrelevant for your project. You're not bound to a platform. So you can run it wherever you want. Maximum flexibility. And you can just cherry pick the, the components that are required for your project. So you don't need to run the whole monolithic system if you don't need it. If you only need a small part of it, you just cherry pick whatever makes sense in your specific case. Between the services, you have very loose coupling. So all the modules are exchangeable. And the whole application is API first and headless. As well, it makes it very easy to integrate into the solutions of your choice and uh, gives you maxi uh, provides maximum flexibility again also for other solutions. And Velox is built on Java with Spring Boot, uh, React, Apache Camel, and uh, Elastic Stack for uh, the, the search itself and for, for uh, monitoring. And we can run it on uh, Docker and KAS. So again, there all diff, uh, all kind of standard technology, no special dedicated know-how you need to have, and uh, so it's easy to maintain and to develop for uh, many developers. Yeah, I think there's much more people on the market who know Java and Spring exactly. than there are developers on the market who know SAP solution or Intershop solution or Elastic Path or whatever. I mean, a lot of them are also based on, on Java. For sure, there's also a, a few of them based on PHP, but they always required quite some some training and some kind of experience. Some certification to on top or even certifications like to, yeah, to get kind yeah. of to the, the premium partnership. And I mean, we're here using really the standard stack for, for Java microservice architecture, right? I mean, exactly. we had uh, some discussions just a few weeks ago, ago about Quarkus, which is, is also, I think, a, a really cool framework for for microservices. But so far, I mean, we, we just stick to, to the standards, to, to things everyone knows, because the target is that we and other developers will all understand the architecture and the implementation, right? Mm -hmm. Then let's have a look at the architecture we use in Velox. So we have uh, a lot of services that handle the single service. And exactly, Rene pointed out now. And the, the services, they don't communicate with other services at all. So to the communication between the services, we used uh, only the orchestration layer. On the orchestration layer, you have um, implementations you can think of as use cases. One example is the, the checkout. So all the communication that needs to happen between the services goes from the, from the checkout, and the checkout then goes to the different services to get all the, the information needed and to write the order back to the, to the order service. So now if you decide, that you need to have your own order service as in with, with a bridge to your or adapted to your um, ERP, then all you need to touch is the order service itself and the use cases that use the service if something on the API changes. And so there's not a lot of communication you need to also change between the services. I think also important are two additional things. I mean, we talked before about kind of the, the database model of a monolithic system, right? I mean, all of our services have rather easy database models, right? They have maybe, let's say, three to 10 tables, not more, five relations. And we always use a database which fits the need. We, we, we never use just 
a relational database just because we have it already there we use for every service the correct or the i mean the the, the database which we think best is really a good choice best practice yeah. uh, according exactly. to the current needs right i mean for for transactions for for writing orders we, we use a sql database for catalog information we use nosql databases and for the search index i mean at the end it's just also a nosql database for sure it's something lucene based right and uh, we, we we don't just use whatever is there we use what we think is the best choice for a certain problem exactly one question is maybe also why integration goes over service orchestration and presentation right and the, the the difference is or the reason why integration is not only done on an orchestration level is that many integrations from modern tools like SaaS solutions are done direct, directly in the front end via widgets. So that's why integration nowadays is not only a backend problem, right? So that's maybe a little explanation. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Then what different, we talked a bit about the use cases before. So what can be the use cases where you can apply Velox for? So if you have a CMS page and you want some e-commerce functionality to integrate it in your website, you can just cherry pick whatever is relevant for, for this case. Um, if you have a complex B2B e-commerce, then you might want to start with the um, accelerator and go from, from there to replace services with uh, integrations into exactly your system, into your, your environment where the sh service or Velox should run. Um, if you already have an existing e-commerce application running and you only want to replace certain use case, let's say registration, then you just take the registration, orchestration, and the services that's relevant for that. All the other stuff stays in your current system. And then next use case, now you already have the registration in place. So maybe you're unhappy with the, the next use case as well, then you just take the next one. So it's very easy to do a modular soft migration to, to Velox. There's no need for a big bang. You can just take one after the other and um, yeah, sl uh, slowly move there. For smaller businesses, maybe it's even enough to just run Velox with the standalone implementation. And when the business grows, then maybe after a while you want to rewrite your CRM integration service or you want to have the custom implementation into your ERP, but that, that's maybe not needed from day one. But so you can start with a standalone and go from there. Or also if you have your own application, let's say an e-learning application, and you basically just need a buy button for an annual subscription and you just take the, the checkout orchestration and the services you need with that. So it's extremely modular approach of the cherry picking allows you to integrate it in so many different ways and still provide you the maximum um, flexibility. For me, really important is this, this modular soft migration, right? Because I mean, the, the way we normally do projects is something which is called the, the agile waterfall right because first of all with the complexity we have it's it's not easy to just start kind of story by story you first you need an, an overview need, you need a target architecture and we also really struggle with an mvp right i mean how can you replace a fully functional web shop with an mvp of the next generation right our mvp normally means feature complete that there, there is we, we can't just deploy i mean i think digitech made it right they deployed like like three four years ago a beta version of the online shop but then it was running in parallel for at least two or three years our customers they when they want to launch the new shop they want to have it feature complete at least like 90 percent right so there is no easy way how we can develop in a lean way and just implement the necessary kind of the 80% and then launch it and see where it's going from there. The customers and also the end customers, like they, they expect a fully functional web shop. But maybe some of you have an idea how we can kind of apply 
the lean principle or an MVP to a fully functional web shop and replace it with this, right? But so far, <coughs> we didn't find out how to do it. So we we always finish the project before we deploy, uh, we relaunch it. I mean, for sure, we do continuous deployments and integrations, but before we launch it, it has to be finished, right? We will also uh, soon make a, a blog post on, on slide.ch about how we think this, this uh, modular migration could take place, how we can migrate an existing monolithic system and slowly migrate it to microservice architecture. Mm -hmm. Then let me explain a bit about the development process. We apply it to develop um, internally and with contributors at the same time. So the, the challenges we are facing is we need to plan the internal development and we also want to enable and support external contributors. But of course, from external contributors, you will not get a fixed commitment how much time they are willing to invest in the next two or three weeks. And most of them are also not very keen to have regular meetings during business hours, such as spring change, backlog refinement, daily. And so, this was a bit of a challenge we had to, to solve and to, to bring this both together. So what we came up with is like a two-phase um, development process. So on the one side, uh, we share the, the same product backlog, but the contributors, so the contributors and uh, Sly, we both bring um, stories into the, the backlog. Then the Sly team refines it and contributors can cherry pick whatever story they feel like working on and create merge requests to the team again whenever they're, they're ready with their stuff. The new code, new feature, bug fix. So however uh, long it takes, they can just send the, the merge request after that. Then on the other hand, we have a regular Scrum process in place. So with two weeks iteration, regular sprint planning, and the sprint review, retro, and daily meetings. So that's, let's say, the normal Scrum development process. And both of these uh, paths lead to new uh, releases in the end. So the last topic we would like to address today is the question, in, if we build kind of the next generation online shop, why do we do it open source? Right, and I mean, today, I think it's also a little bit about this question. And to answer this, we, we maybe also have to have a look at the, the codex of Sly, which we defined a bit more than four years ago, right? The, the main principles behind Sly, and it's mainly transparency and no locking conditions, right? Continuous improvements and professional development. I think that's clear for, for engineering companies, but for us, it's important we, we never want to build a software where the customer is bound with a license to our company, right? I mean, that's beneficial if the, the software and the kind of the, the consulting is not the same or the software vendor and the consulting is not the same, you can always switch. And that's also important for us that we, we don't want to make a, a lock into the customers and we want to be fully transparent. And uh, when we decided to kind of build Velox, we said, okay, then it's pretty clear, right? I mean, Velox will be open source because open source gives the transparency to the customer that whatever we do, he can review it, he can judge the quality, he can review the technology, he can copy and own it. If he if he's not happy anymore with us, he can take it to the a different agency. Uh, he doesn't need us to to ask for access to the source code, right? And at the end. Source code is also a, an important part of documentation. Don't get me wrong, source code is not the documentation. I'm not a fan of doc the, the source code will document itself. We also had discussions with some architects who say, you know, clean code doesn't need documentation. I mean, for me, that's not true. When I look at the class and I read the class name, that it was never clear what the class is doing. It's very seldom that you just read the class name and you know what it's doing. So documentation is required, but I guess some of you have worked with closed source projects where you have a black box and it just doesn't work as you expect, right? It's somehow buggy or maybe your 
using it wrongly. And then what do you do? I mean, you, you maybe go to the vendor or you even decompile the software. And, and for me, it's clear if, you're, if I want to work with the software, I need the source code. I need to be able to debug it. I need to, de to be able to read it. And one additional part is also for, for education, right? I mean, if, if we meet other developers and we talk with them about e-commerce or we talk with them about microservice architecture, we can show them our code, uh, the source code, but also the infrastructure code, our Docker Compose, our Kubernetes configuration. We can show it and exchange it and, and they can challenge it and they can maybe also improve it together with us. And then the last part is, is also to allow others to contribute, right? I mean, you're still pretty in the beginning. So far, we have one or like, like we have like 10 people who said it's interesting. We want to participate. I mean, one of them really built it and, and gave us some real feedbacks. But I think this, this will, we'll see how this will work out in the future, right? But I mean, we want to allow it and we want to gain experience on, on how this is adapted in the open source community, right? And for sure, for us, it's important. I mean, our USP, the reason why you come to us is not because of the source code of Velox. It's because we have more than 20 years experience in B2B e-commerce and we know how to do the integration. It's not that we are the only ones who know how to build a microservice, right? But we have the all overall know-how and experience which is required to to make those projects successful and that's why we we never thought about uh, it is beneficial to hide our code from from anyone right i think that's it luca something mm -hmm. to add no so i guess you you know where to find us the, the solution is velox.switch, Swiss, switch, Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> the company is sly.ch, and uh, yeah, you will find us everywhere on LinkedIn. I think we even have a Facebook page, but I guess no one is on Facebook anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for being here and for this interesting talk about uh, why standard solutions fail. Uh, René Nuka from uh, Sly Game Very welcome. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Yeah, nice to see that you decided to open source uh, Velox. You know, um, we all know the developer pain of working with uh, closed source solutions, and um, I that, guess so, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's nice to see. Yeah, we have a question. Um, you talked about the shared backlog. Is this backlog also open source slash transparent? Yes, yes, it, it is. is. It's, it's on uh, uh, GitLab, mm -hmm. in, the, in the project directly. And that's also the backlog we are using. So also all our comments and the history of everything is open source, yeah. And cool. the documentation is mostly in the wiki and on GitLab as well, so also fully transparent. Awesome. Do you use all the, do you use the continuous integration and continuous delivery features of GitLab? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, we have a private runner. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to deploy on, on our own infrastructure, which is only accessible via VPN. But uh, the, you can see the GitLab CI configuration. It's, it's also open source, and we're not using any special things except the private runner. Yeah. Are there already companies using Velox? Um, or do no. you know of any? <laughs> no, no. I mean, the final release, which uh, was called Uetliberg, I think we launched it around two months ago. Yeah, I think. Uh, March, so it's pretty fresh. Wrong. We did not yet start with with marketing. So if you look at our posts and our LinkedIns, I think it's never uh, the the release is mentioned. But I mean, we have not yet started to promote it. We have uh, also some other projects going on. Uh, we want to make it a bit more feature complete, right? Uh, we're in contact with some some prospects, but so far there is no project. So uh, we're still looking for a pilot project, actually. Yeah. So, so if, if you need, need an online, online shop, shop, then then you get discount happy. for being the first. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you make it on the license. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we give you a free license. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> we have another question coming in. Uh, what was the reasoning to go API first from the get-go? Um, 
again, I think it's our experience. I mean, yeah, if you look around, yeah. I mean, all the e-commerce solutions, not all of them, but the, the major ones, they're now also switching to headless, right? I mean, we, we kind of, uh, we, we talk about headless already a couple of years. They're slowly adapting. I mean, you can also look at some of the CMS systems, uh, Magnolia, uh, also Adobe, they're also switching to headless, but they all introduce it kind of monolithic first, headless, then they just introduce this later and i think if you build a new application uh, nowadays and you also want to benefit from from more modern front-end technology i think that's the only way to go right you need to have a yeah. stable api which is easy to use uh, otherwise no one will use it right no, so, what, so what we said uh, before that really b2b is about integration and integrating other systems so it's it kind of makes sense that our system is also easy to integrate into other solutions and so that we provide a proper api right from the beginning and enable others to to use us uh, the solution in a way we also would like to use other applications and i mean it's a modular modular system right so if you want to only want to take parts of it how else can it work as through a very well-defined api right and i mean the the documentation of the APIs is not so easy. I mean, we, we generate Swagger from, from Java, uh, but it, it also messes up a little code. So we split kind of the, the controller interface where we do the Swagger documentation from the controller implementation, which helps us to keep it quite tidy. But I mean, if you just have a normal controller and you add the whole boiler, boilerplate for, for Swagger, yeah. it's more it's annotation than code. It's quite <laughs> ugly. And, yeah. but we still, we, we wanted to have code first and generate the API documentation. I guess also a lot of people kind of generate or kind of define the Swagger file and then generate the API, but we are more used to, to develop with annotations in Java than we are used to, I think it's what I don't remember. It's, it's YAML, I guess. Mm. Yeah. I'm anyway, not the biggest fan of YAML yeah. <laughs> since I, since I stopped developing Fortran, I kind of stopped using indents for defining kind of the, the syntax of my, my development. So I'm, I'm not such a big fan of YAML. So we decided to use Java and define the annotations for the document. Documentation and I think with splitting mm. this with the interface and the implementation is this is quite a good approach. But then yeah. Yeah, uh, have a look at it and tell us if if you know better, right? Okay, yeah. Mm. Um, do you have? I know you're not ready, right? Uh, but do you already got some contributions from other companies or other people or at all or not yet? I guess. I mean, we we got yeah, feedback yeah. from from two guys. I mean, they they kind of checked it out and wanted to do to a start, and it it was mainly about documentation. So they contributed to the documentation, mainly to the kind of getting started area, how to set up debugger, how to use your project in IntelliJ, uh, what should I do on the command line, what can I do in, in, in the IDEA. That's a stuff like which we, we, in the beginning, we didn't think about documenting this, right? How to kind of develop Velox in, in IntelliJ because I mean, we just start doing it. And I think that's the, the feedback we got so far was more about uh, how to develop and it was not really features. Yeah. Um, not features, but also something we got was uh, a review of our front end, yeah. befriended company that uh, took the time to yeah to have an in-depth review of the front end because we are more the back end guys. And so uh, we decided to to get an external insight or to ask for an insight there as well. So yeah, there were already two front end yeah, guys yeah, reviewing right. what what we made made. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was but more on, really on review on feedback and not on contributing features yeah. so far. They didn't fix it, but at least they told us what we did <laughs> at least wrong. They told us what should be fixed. <laughs> yeah. Cool, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to where this is all going and um, mm. curious about it.